Trans rights, trans rights, trans rights, trans rights, trans rights, trans rights are human rights. Trans people shouldn't be killed or prevented from holding a job or renting a place. Adults should be left alone to do what they like with their bodies. There, have I virtue signaled enough to be allowed to talk about this topic? Trans women competing against cis women in professional level sports is currently the big topic of conversation online right now, because transgender swimmer Leah Thomas won the women's 500 yard NCAA title. The controversy stems from the fact that Leah Thomas swam for Penn State for three years before transitioning, then sat out one year to transition, then returned to compete as a woman. People who view Leah's inclusion in the women's division as unfair point to the fact that she went through a fully male puberty until the age of 21, and has only been on hormones for one year, giving her a physical advantage that cis women cannot hope to overcome. These people also point to the fact that Leah has been shattering women's records left and right since transitioning, and that the cis women she beat feel cheated. People who oppose this view, who are on Leah's side, point to the fact that the online outrage machine only seems to care about trans athletes when they're winning against cis athletes. That actually seems to be the case, because among all of this kerfuffle, nobody who's currently complaining about Leah has noticed that she's quietly placed eighth in the 100 yard race, and in fact, she was beat in that race by a trans man who was still required to swim in the women's league because they hadn't begun hormonally transitioning yet. But even though the online outrage machine might have a short attention span, that does not automatically disqualify their question. And that question seems to be, should trans women be competing against cis women in professional sports? It's a question that's been floating around a lot longer than Leah Thomas. This debate first flared up in 2014, when Fallon Fox, a trans woman MMA fighter, overpowered Tamika Brents so severely in a match that she suffered a broken skull. Brents later said, I have fought a lot of women, and I've never felt the strength that I felt in a fight as I did that night. I can't answer answer whether it's because she was born a man or not because I'm not a doctor. I can only say I've never felt so overpowered ever in my life, and I am an abnormally strong female in my own right. This does seem pretty outrageous, but like with Leia, it was ignored by those who were outraged that Fox had herself lost to a cis woman, Ashley Evans Smith, a year prior. At the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, a lot of noise was made about the inclusion of trans weightlifter Laurel Hubbard, who lived as a cis male for 35 years before transitioning, with all of the advantages of a male puberty and a male adult life. Hubbard didn't compete in weightlifting at all pre-transition, but post-transition in 2012, she began winning elite titles in women's divisions. However, like Leah Thomas and Fallon Fox, Hubbard quietly failed at the Tokyo Olympics, failing to place at all and this, again, went unnoticed by the online outrage machine. While I was researching this video, I noticed that this was a trend. Every time the online right cried foul at the inclusion of a high-profile trans athlete into a woman's league, it turns out that the career of that trans woman in their sport is not entirely filled with pure subjugation of every female who stands before them, or the complete and total domination of every previously held record. In fact, when that trans woman inevitably fails, because most athletes eventually do, the spotlight has already moved on and nobody noticed. But this is not to say that I'm actually pro-trans women in cis women's sports. In the end, I'm not. And I can absolutely tell you why. Not by appealing to the anecdotes of Laurel Hubbard, or Fallon Fox, or Leah Thomas. Instead, let's talk about something more concrete. Here is the study Transgender Women in the Female Category of Sport, Perspectives on Testosterone Suppression and Performance Advantage. Let's look it over together. The study begins by describing the biological basis for sporting performance advantages in males, essentially what makes men better at sports. The study states that during puberty, testes-derived testosterone levels increase 20-fold in males, but remain low in females, resulting in circulating testosterone concentrations at least 15 times higher in males than in females of any age. Testosterone in males induces changes in muscle mass, strength, anthropomorphic variables, and hemoglobin levels as part of the range of sexually dimorphic characteristics observed in humans. And even before puberty, this makes a difference. Some 6,500 genes are differentially expressed between males and females, with an estimated 3,000 sex-specific differences in skeletal muscle likely to influence composition and function beyond the effects of androgenization, I, I can't pronounce that word, while increased testosterone during mini-puberty in males aged 1 to 6 months may be correlated with higher growth velocity, and an imprinting effect on BMI and body weight. So, in general, males are stronger than females. I don't think that's groundbreaking news to anybody. That strength plays out differently depending on what sport we're talking about, but it's always there. 
Here's a chart that plots the differences between the average male and female professional athletes of the same sport. All of the female athletes averages are set to 100% for their sports so that we may see how much more effective the average male athlete is at the sport. In rowing, for example, the average male athlete is only 10% more effective than the average female athlete, meaning that on a professional level, male athletes are out rowing female athletes by an average of 10%. There's a similar range for swimming and running. Cycling, the gap increases to 16%, but as you can see, there's more variance at the top. That's what that little secondary range range means. There's a similar gap hovering around 20% for jumping, kicking, tennis, golf, handball, and pole vault. The gap increases to around 30% for cricket, volleyball, long drives in golf, and weightlifting. For baseball and field hockey, the gap is 50%. I've heard a lot of trans activists make the point that it's not just biology, but also social differences in the promotion of sport. Most notably, Mia Mulder, where in her video, should a trans woman be allowed in women's sports, that, uh, that sounds familiar, she says, When women began being involved in sport, sports science and other things relating to sport had not been adapted for women bodies. The entire playing field had already been made by and for men. And that's not to mention that most athletes then and even now are men. Which means that when we're talking about high level competitions, men will have more competition to even reach that stage, which will make them perform better. If you have 500 men competing in a sport, and only 10 women competing in the same sport, odds are the men are going to outperform the women, even if the playing field is completely level. Which means that there's basically no way for women to actually compete with men, even when there is no biological difference. And you know, that's actually a good point. If men have been playing and competing against each other for centuries and women are only just starting up, there's certainly a cumulative effect, not on any one man, but on the surrounding culture of sport, how to train, what to eat, the quality of the surrounding competition that you can train yourself against. In most cases, top-level female athletes are not given the same level of consideration as top-level male athletes. This again should surprise no one. But unfortunately for Mia Mulder, this study also covers that too. It is acknowledged that this divergence has been compounded historically by a lag in the cultural acceptance of and financial provision for females in sport that may have had implications for the rate of improvement in athletic performance in females. Yet, since the 1990s, the difference in performance records between males and females has been relatively stable, suggesting that the biological differences created by androgenization explain most of the male advantage and are insurmountable. Oh well, it turns out even when things are culturally constructed, the foundation that they're built atop of is biological. Who knew? Now that the study has definitively laid out that the difference between males and females in sport is primarily based in biology, it then turns its attention to trans women in sport. Is the male performance advantage lost when testosterone is suppressed in transgender women? Let's look at the data. Here's a chart of changes in muscle mass and strength in trans women athletes pre-testosterone suppression, as well as after at least 12 months of testosterone suppression, compared with demographically matched female athletes. Here's how you read the graph. The 0% mark on the graph is the pre-suppression location in all instances, again for easy comparison. For the first entry, the data comes from a 2004 study and compares with 36 months on testosterone suppression, focusing on thigh muscle mass. So after the 36 months, the change was a 12% loss of thigh muscle mass in the trans athletes, which is still 13% more muscle mass than in their cis counterparts. Going down this graph, the results are damning. The amount of strength and muscle mass for these various body parts and exercises are mostly in the single digits post testosterone, and their advantages over their cis counterparts remains huge. Here's the same data set, this time with the pre-suppression at trans figures anchored to 100%, and it also includes average male athletes. Pre-suppression at trans are the white circles, post-suppression trans are the black circles, males are diamonds, females are squares. For example, in grip strength, men were significantly stronger than both cis and trans women, but trans women were significantly stronger than cis women, and 12 months on test suppression only slightly lowered that advantage. The study concludes that strength, lean body mass, muscle size, and bone density are only trivially affected by testosterone suppression and the reductions observed in muscle mass, size, and strength are very small compared to the baseline differences between males and females in these variables. And thus, there are major performance and safety implications in sports where these attributes are competitively significant. The data significantly undermines the delivery of fairness and safety presumed by the criteria set out in transgender inclusion policies, particularly given the stated prioritization of fairness as an overriding objective for the IOC. If those policies are intended to preserve fairness, inclusion, and the safety of biologically female athletes, sporting organizations may 
need to reassess their policies regarding the inclusion of transgender women. There is another study that says basically the same thing. We don't gotta pour over it because I think the point's been made, but you can check it for yourself if you want. It's called How Does Hormone Transition in Transgender Women Change Body Composition, Muscle Strength, and Hemoglobin? Systematic review with a focus on the implications for sport participation. Its conclusion states, in trans women, hormone therapy rapidly reduces HGB to levels seen in cisgender women. In contrast, hormone therapy decreases strength, LBM, and muscle area, yet values remain above that observed in cisgender women, even after 36 months. These findings suggest that strength may well be preserved in trans women during the first three years of hormone therapy. Okay, yes, I think it's fair to say at this point that trans women have a significant advantage against cis women in professional level sport. And like the conclusion of the previous study said, if fairness and inclusion of cis women is the goal, then the inclusion of trans women may not be compatible with that goal. Of course, some trans women athletes just don't care. In 2019, Rachel McKinnon picked up a gold medal for cycling at the 2019 Masters Track Cycling World Championships as a trans woman competing against cis women. And she had this to say about it. I'm legally and medically female, but the people who oppose my existence still want to think of me as male. They use the language of that I'm a man. And so there's this stereotype that men are always stronger than women. And so if you think of trans women as men, then you think there's an unfair advantage. Do you accept that there, there may still be an advantage? Is it possible? Yes. Um, however, the range of body sizes and strength levels within a sport, you can be successful with massively different body compositions, even within my sport. Yeah, just straight up. It's possible I have an advantage because I'm biologically male, but I'll just hand wave that with, oh, there's all sorts of body types. It's bullshit. We all know that you're just muddying the waters because you have a gold medal that you want to keep. We get it. And then there's cases of trans women who have not yet medically transitioned or whose transition status is unknown. And despite that, they run against cis women anyway. That's just BS. Medically, in terms of physical fitness, not their identity or how they view themselves, they are on par with cis men. They're biologically males with either no testosterone suppression or no lasting effects from newly begun suppression. This is purely ridiculous. There's a lot of arguments from trans activists to try and counter all of this stuff. A lot of them are summarized in Mia Mulder's video, but not all of them. For example, Castro Semenya is often brought up, the runner from South Africa who turned out to be intersex, but she didn't know it. That fact was discovered after she had been running professionally and shattering records, and the league ended up testing her to see if she was using steroids or had some kind of medical condition. The media in South Africa treated Semenya quite poorly once it came out that she had naturally elevated levels of testosterone due to the presence of internal testes, aka balls inside her body where her ovaries should be, despite outwardly completely appearing to be female. In 2019, citing Semenya's case, new world athletics rules came into force stating that people like Semenya would have to take testosterone suppressants to compete in women's leagues. It may give trans activists a lot of moral weight to appeal to the terrible way in which Semenya was treated, having this fact about herself that she didn't even know outed publicly and humiliatingly. And yeah, fair enough, but that doesn't actually bolster any arguments regarding trans women in sports. Because Semenya isn't trans, intersex isn't trans, trans isn't intersex, and the way the trans community appropriates intersex issues to prop up their own arguments is honestly pretty disgusting. Desiring to transition because you have gender dysphoria and being born with a genital deformation that causes abnormal hormonal effects are not the same thing despite the possibility for some overlap. Arguments like Rachel McKinnon's are brought up, that it's all just different body types and who cares. The downstream conclusion from that position comes with multiple suggestions, each with their own problems. For example, rather than differentiating males from females, why don't we differentiate based on weight or height class? The issue there being that males would dominate almost every single one of those classes in every single sport. Another suggestion is that we differentiate based on various hormone levels, but as the studies that we've talked about today show, that doesn't actually equalize the playing field. The male puberty is still a problem. The counter to that complaint, the it doesn't equalize the playing field one, is often for the trans activist to bring up Michael Phelps. He does actually have a genetic abnormality, giving him an abnormally long wingspan. I still find it funny it's called a wingspan on humans. As well as another abnormality concerning the buildup of lactic acid in his muscles, giving him more stamina. Clearly, these genetic differences make it unfair for regular males to compete against him, right? So why is he included? And you know, fair enough. But ultimately, sport is about competition. It's about finding the best athlete. So by what metric do we decide where a line should be drawn? The natural end result of this is saying, fuck it, there's no metrics, there's no sex classes, there's no weight or height classes, all genetic abnormalities are allowed, it will just be a free-for-all. 
And fine, fair enough, you can do that. But that means that cis males will win every single sporting competition ever. In other words, when TERFs say something like they want to take away women's spaces, in this instance, if we followed the logic to its natural conclusion, the TERFs would actually be correct. We would be taking away that biologically female, the cis woman sporting space. And in many instances, we would also be taking away trans women's sporting spaces as well. And if you're more on the pro-trans side of things listening to this, thinking, nah, no way, that's just hyperbole. There's no way that any trans activist thinks that. Here is a trans activist saying exactly that on a panel on this topic from just a few days ago. I think wine moms like... Uh essentially idea of a, a ranking system based on skill is completely fine and that you have classes for like the 800 to 1000 the 600 to you know 799 shit like that sounds completely reasonable to me and if it eliminates uh, women's spaces from uh, sports and makes it so that i mean keep in mind it'd be eliminating men's spaces from sports as well and i have absolutely no issue with that um, the TERFs are completely right. I do want to uh, actually get rid of gendered spaces uh, in the sports arena and that they are 100% right. And I don't base my opinions off of uh, what the most radical TERFs, you know, fear that I'm going to do. So to me, this open it all up solution seems to be completely untenable. The reason that we have women's sport is because generally women can't compete with men. And so they have a place where they can play with people who are generally on their own level. It's so funny to hear Prague say shit like, we can't implement blind hiring practices because not enough black people will get hired if you just leave it down to qualifications. We need diversity hires. But then they completely 180 on that logic when it comes to women in sport. What they want will literally lead to a huge population, cis women, being not represented at all in almost any physical arena. Putting trans women into women's leagues, frankly, seems un fair to cis women. Not only that, but those same rules mean that trans men will never be able to outcompete cis men at sport, something that trans activists never actually think about, because trans men also lack the advantages of that male puberty. No matter what, somebody is getting excluded here. My preferred solution is to create trans men and trans women's leagues of their own. If you go back to that study that I talked about before and look at that graph that averaged the differences of all the measurements, you will see that the gap between men and post-suppression trans women is similar to the gap between trans women and cis women. They are clearly their own classification sports-wise. The common trans activist counter argument to this is that there's so few trans women they'd never actually be able to form a league. And yeah, that unfortunately also seems to be true, but it is still the least bad option. Having cis men destroy trans women or having trans women destroy cis women seems to be erasing a population from sport entirely. Abolishing categories might appeal to that socialist or anarchist spirit on the left, but it does the same thing in reality. The least bad option is trans specific sports leagues where they may compete on a relatively even playing field with other athletes. If women's leagues can become more popular over time and play catch up with the men's leagues, then surely trans women's leagues can too.